Hi, welcome to the session 17, Visual Displays Device One. Uh, in this session, we will have five papers. The first paper will be uh, factor the occlusion, single spatial light modulator occlusion capable optical see-through augmented reality display. Uh, it, the author, uh, Brooke Krajin Sich, uh, Nish Padman Naban, uh, and Gordon Weststein from Stanford University. The, this paper will be presented by Buki Krajin Sich. Uh, let's welcome. Great, I think I'm all good now. Great, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Brooke, I'm a PhD student at Stanford at the moment, and I'm here to present our work on uh, occlusion capable augmented reality using a single spatial light modulator. Again, on behalf of my co-authors, Natish Padmanaban and Gordon Whitestein from the Stanford Computational Imaging Lab. So as many of you are aware, augmented reality is widely believed to become a next generation computing platform with applications including education, design, medicine, and training. But the true magic of AR is the potential to render digital content indistinguishable from the real world. But achieving this requires great displays that come as close as possible to matching normal perception. However, commercial optical see-through displays instead produce this, since they are currently unable to properly support occlusion. Occlusion describes the phenomenon where objects at some distance to the user partially or fully block light from objects at farther distances. This cue provides the human visual system with important information about depth. And so failure to properly emulate occlusion, meaning that virtual content appears semi-transparent, not only detracts from perceived realism, but could be dangerous, inducing user error in tasks involving spatial judgment, since relative depth is harder to determine. So current generation displays use optical combiners that additively superimpose the digital content as displayed often by a spatial light modulator or SLM on a direct view of the physical scene. An inability to block real light leads to digital content appearing semi-transparent and non-realistic. Now, many previous works initially by Kiyokawa et al and most recently by Hamasaki and Ito has demonstrated occlusion capability by using an additional SLM for pixel by pixel blocking of the physical scene. However, as seen by the ELMO4 system, developed by Kiyokawa et al. This comes with the cost of increasing the complexity of optical and electronic systems, and hence form factor, power requirements, and need for robust alignment and calibration. So instead, we propose factored occlusion, a new approach to obtaining pixel precise mutual occlusion. Instead of taking the conventional approach of adding digital and real content, we propose a new type of display that merges real and virtual light paths in a multiplicative manner. This enables us to improve occlusion ability without adding an extra SLM. So to do this, we utilize the pixel states of a digital micromirror device, or DMT. Most commonly found in projectors for their high light efficiency, the pixel grid of a DMD is an array of microelectronic mechanical mirrors. For explanation purposes, we'll represent this device as four pixels. Now, when used as a digital light projector, these micromirrors can be individually programmed to flip between an on state, where the light from an RGB LED is directed towards a viewer, or an off state, where the light is directed towards a light dump and the user sees no light. So in this way, a DMD can display color images by separating them into their red, green, and blue components. Duty cycle, or the ratio of the time that a pixel stays on for, is used to modulate intensity within each component. For example, this pixel would have a higher duty cycle, staying on for longer than this one, where not as much red is needed. Now, because these mirrors flip at kilohertz frequency, we can switch the LED to render all three color channels in the same way, which will sum to produce the final image under the integration time of the eye. We can also easily see how a DMD could be used to generate an occlusion mask on a real scene. We just flip those pixels to be definitely switched towards the off state, blocking the light coming from the scene. But in this work, we wanted to do both concurrently. We wanted to see, can we effectively block real light coming from this real tree and render this virtual flower in its place? 
So to do this, we replace the light dump in a standard DMD with the physical scene. In this way, we can see that getting the pixels around the flower are easy. We can just set those micro mirrors to show the real world. But now let's try to render the flower. Starting with the red channel, we can see that we immediately hit a problem. How do we modulate the intensity of the red? Since we no longer have the night dump, instead we've got green coming from the tree in the background. So we would have to modulate between red and green, which isn't ideal. So as is often the case, we can see here that we can't give you a free lunch. So we're going to have to cop some color degradation. But this is not always the case. So for example, we could probably do a great job with the blue channel, since we know that the leaves in the flower are in fact green. So instead of having no light, we could flip those pixels to the real scene and use the green from there to help reconstruct them without color degradation. And following that line of thought, perhaps we don't even need to switch the LED to green. We could use the green in the background. But then who says that we need red, then blue, then green? We could turn the LED to purple or even completely off to help generate some of the darker parts of the red channel. So really, we would like to know what would be the optimum series of, DM, of LED colors and DMD flips to best rep reproduce the target composition. So you might be getting the hint here that if we know the real scene and we know what and where we want to render virtual content, this lends itself nicely to be formulated as an optimization problem which is exactly what we did. So we developed a factorization algorithm to compute the optimal series of DMD and LED states to construct a target scene composition O. So we first derive an image formation model, O hat, that mathematically describes the image that the user sees as a combination of the physical scene R, modulated by the DMD states D, and then temporally varying LED colors and intensities L. We formulate this as an objective function and derive a set of update rules, which we use to iteratively converge towards the target composition. So I'll refer you to our paper for full derivations of this. So here we can see a short snapshot of how our optimization approach converges towards the optimal result in under 10 iterations. And here we show how the optimal series of DMD and LED states combine under the integration time of the eye to form the final image. So to validate our simulations, we implemented a benchtop prototype. So you can see that the real scene comes in through the focusing optics here. And on the other side, we have the LED, which first goes into a diffuser before landing on the DMD. And we record the time multiplex result um, with the digital camera here. So here's a Lion, scene, a Lion King inspired scene composition. So shown down the bottom there, where you can see that the rhino and the shadows are the added digital content. At the top, I show the simulated output of what our approach should be able to achieve. And here's what we captured, which you can see shows an improvement in inclusion capability and rendered color of the Rhino compared to that that would be produced by a conventional beam splitter configuration here. In particular, the ability to block real light means that we can now render realistic shadow effects. However, as one might expect, our method is not without its trade-offs. So by its construction, we optimize a trade-off between the accuracy of the desired occlusion mask and the color fidelity of the digital image. It could be seen that the leaves of the tree are still visible through the rhino rendering, with the system being unable to recreate the complex shading of the rhino while simultaneously subtracting out the background. However, the nice thing about our setup is that we can really see how the approach works. So we can isolate each light path. So I can cover the LED and just let in light from the physical scene, and we can see just the occlusion mask. Note that unlike previous occlusion techniques that use a second SLM, light is not actually fully blocked within the rhino shape here. This is because some of the yellow in the scene is being used to reconstruct the rhino image as we can visualize here. So now this is the light being added by the LED. So this time I've covered up the physical scene. You can see that the optimization approach has figured out that it needs to add real light where the rhino is in front of the green tree. And moreover, 
add a color such that the tree doesn't need to be fully occluded and instead the light can combine with the green in the background to produce the target color of the rhino. Then adding back in the physical scene, we can see the final captured result that I showed before. So here is another perhaps even better result where the color degradation is minimal and obviously there's a significant improvement over that chair rendering compared to the conventional beam splitter configuration. Rendering the, an elephant also works well with only minor color degradations where the ear is in front of the tree, again, similar to the rhino. And again, we can realistically render shadows now that we can enable occlusion. And finally, rendering Alice a tea party set again shows a significant improvement over the conventional. Um, when the background is bright, light blockage is particularly important to prevent ghostly looking digital content, which you can see is a problem in the middle there. So we also demonstrate that we can mitigate these color degradation effects with the gaze contingent display mode. For example, say that we wanted to render the above red and blue birds. Using the global optimization approach previously described, both birds lack full color and detail due to the dynamic range limitations of the approach. But if we had eye tracking and knew that a user was looking closer to the blue bird, we could assign higher weights to those pixels in the optimization formulation, which as just demonstrated here, could locally improve correct digital and occlusion rendering in that area. So we do notice, however, that the rendering of the, blue, of the red bird slightly worsens. And similarly, if the person was to move over here, the red bird uh, gets better, but the blue bird fades. But it's unlikely that these would be sort of seen in the periphery. And back to the blue. So in summary, we present factored occlusion, a new approach to obtaining pixel precise mutual occlusion by merging real and virtual light paths on a single SLM. But of course, it's not without its limitations. The proposed system reduces hardware complexity, but at the cost of increased computational requirements. Hence, power consumption, for example, becomes a trade-off. However, computing resources on wearable devices are quickly advancing. And so increasing de the development in custom processes could see algorithm, algorithm, algorithms like the one we propose be become part of future application-specific integrated circuits. Unlike waveguide displays, the real scene is modulated by a pixel grid. However, the use of a DMD means that the see-through state does not suffer from the light loss of transmissive displays, such as LCDs, used by previous approaches. The use of a single display also means that the calibration and registration is simpler and could lend itself better to smaller form factors. We do not demonstrate this, however, with the benchtop implementation we construct being neither wearable nor real time. We obtain run times of about 15 seconds with an unoptimized MATLAB implementation of the algorithm. Although that we expect this to drop dramatically with a GPU formulation. So concentrating on evaluating the display approach, we currently use rather bulky focusing optics that make up the majority of the large form factor. However, the approach places no limitations on the type of optical elements that could be used. And thus future work will investigate the multitude of paths towards miniaturization. Other future directions could investigate different loss functions for the optimization formulation. Currently, we use a least squares loss function applied to linear intensities. So while this works for many scenes, reformulating our objective to minimize the error in a perceptually more uniform space, such as CIE lab, could further improve the perceived quality of results. Other displays could also be used in a similar and perhaps more effective way. For example, polarization could be used to switch between virtual and real content rather than mirror directions of a DMD. Furthermore, next generation SLMs are also in development. For example, switchable mirror technology could provide the, fundament, the functional equivalent of a transmissive DMD which would be advantageous for reducing form factor and optical complexity. With this preliminary work, however, we demonstrate a fundamentally new approach to combining real and digital content in optical see-through augmented reality. Rather than using superposition, a configuration that does not lend itself well towards the blockage of light needed to support occlusion, we show that real and virtual light paths can be merged multiplicatively with a single display. 
This enables a fundamentally new way of obtaining occlusion, and factored occlusion represents the first in a line of such approaches. For more details, please refer to our manuscript. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful talk. It's a very interesting idea. So we can uh, look at whether the slide has some questions. So if the audience have questions, you can input your questions into Slido. And uh, while we are waiting, we, uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, I think your your work now is uh, dealing with the static static scene. So sure. how about if, if there's a dynamic uh, scene, how how about you measure the work? Sure. So the the method would work fairly similarly just the idea would be you'd need to be able to render and sort of compute the the series of dmd and um, led states within the the frame rate time so you'd need a gpu implementation to be able to do that quick enough such that it can calculate what it needs to do before the next frame um, were, were to display but the the display principle is is adaptable towards moving content okay thank you uh, i found there are some questions on the slido um, What's the main, main motivation uh, to reduce the number of SLM uh, down to one size or power consumption? Is it still beneficial considering the significant increase in computation cost? Uh, because of the DMD, the uh, field of view will be very small. It's very nice work, he said, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, like as I touched on before, you do uh, power put consumption, for example, does become a trade-off. Um, but we do have the hope that computational uh, computation is increasing faster and uh, advancing faster than uh, hardware. So the and we've seen sort of a lot of technologies that have seen this shift into moving problems from hardware problems into software problems. Um, but you are right, and it's a good point in in that regard. Uh, the hope is that having a single uh, one display is a lot better for, for form factor as well. So if you only have to focus, if you need the fo focusing optics uh, to, to go onto one display, that's going to be better than needing uh, the, between the two if, if we're aiming towards this form factor approach. That being said, we wanted to see if this was possible, um, how good we could get with a single display, and we think that we've made good progress towards that. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how we can move this forward in terms of both miniaturization and power for real world usage. Okay, uh, the last question is from Kiyoshi Kiyokawa. I just uh, added. <laughs> the, next, <laughs> the next question is uh, from Doc Bauman. He, uh, he asked, uh, can you give some insight on the types of uh, real virtual scenes where well, the current approach works well and uh, where well, it doesn't work well? Does it depend on the colors, the light levels or something else? Sure. Yeah, both of those things. You are correct. Particularly where uh, where the where you can't use the color in the background is where we fail the most. So for opposing color combinations. So say for example that I wanted to render a purple object on a green tree. Uh, uh, neither purple does not contain green, so you can't really use the background to help you in that in that sort of rendering trade off. So opposing colors are the hardest and as well when you really do need to block light so you're right the brighter the scene the harder it is um, but you can see that even in the Alice scene that I've got on the slide there it, it does that that sort of bushy area is quite bright um, of a scene and it does fairly well uh, particularly uh, in comparison to the beam splitter configuration um, but yes okay uh, the last question uh, one one more question the last one um, where, uh, what is the maximum number of sources you can have in the SLM? Would it be possible to add a false empty pos position for intensi intensity modulation? Yes, because that would be ideal. If we had a DMD with three states, um, we'd be solid and we wouldn't even need an optimization approach. You could just use the DMD basically how it usually functions. Um, we couldn't find any three such three state system, but that would be an interesting uh, consideration for future work. I have seen the uh, the switchable mirror displays that I briefly mentioned towards the end there. They are working on tech, uh, technology that switches between see-through uh, black and a mirror. 
and that would be the equivalent of what you're talking about. So exactly, if we could get that, we'd be sorted. But I'd, uh, if you know of anyone that's doing it, please send me an email. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Brooke. And so thank you very much. So next, uh, we go to the next uh, talk. Okay. So next talk will be seeing we are uh, heterogeneous microlens iris for compact uh, 180 degrees FOV we are new I displays. Uh, the author is uh, Joseph uh, Radcliffe, um, Oliver Su uh, Supikov, and uh, San Santiago uh, Afro and uh, Ronald Atsuma from Interlabs. So the presentation will be given by Joseph uh, Radcliffe. Okay. Thin VR, heterogeneous microlens arrays for compact 180 degree field of view VR near eye displays. Authors are Joshua Radcliffe, Alexei Supikov, Santiago Alfaro, and Ronald Azuma, all from Intel Labs. I'm Joshua Ratcliffe, and I'll be presenting. Virtual reality head-mounted displays have seen significant adoption in recent years, with millions of units sold. However, numerous technical challenges stymie their broader adoption. One particular set of challenges that interested us were compactness and field of view. Despite major advances in display technology since the 1980s, these systems still retain much of their bulkiness and it can be particularly challenging to achieve both an ultra-wide field of view and a compact form factor at the same time. A major reason for this excessive bulkiness are the large optics and concomitantly long focal lengths required of these optics. I will examine this problem and discuss our own approach to it. There is a rich body of prior work in this area. Unfortunately, time doesn't permit me to go over everything, so I'll examine three categories that we found particularly interesting. First are what we call canned display systems. These displays tilt the angle of the display and or the optics relative to the face, typically to provide ultra-wide fields of view in excess of 180 degrees. In this respect, they succeed in their goal, but they still remain bulky due to their large optical elements and can suffer from peripheral pupil swim issues, a topic that I'll discuss later. These are available today for purchase in systems such as the Pimax 5K and the Star VR. Next are a class of optics known as pancake optics. Pancake systems obtain impressively compact form factors by folding the optical path. This folding is in reality a process of bouncing light between layers of lenses, typically via polarization-based reflection. It can be difficult to simultaneously achieve both an ultra-wide field of view and a compact form factor with this technology, and there are inherent inefficiencies. Michael Abrash discussed this at some length in a recent Oculus talk, which I'd recommend anyone interested to watch. Finally, we have near-eye lens array-based displays. Rather than using a single monolithic element, in this case, the optical system is an array of lenslets. Lemon and Lubke demonstrated light field output in a near-eye lens array-based system, this presented the user with accommodation cues and a rich perception of retinal blur, two features which add visual comfort and realism. However, this came with a fairly extreme loss of spatial resolution. Furthermore, an ultra-wide field of view wasn't demonstrated and could be challenging with the homogeneous arrays used. A picture of one of these prototypes is shown. Note how exceptionally thin this display system is. We were very impressed by this aspect of their approach and were inspired to propose an approach of our own for near-eye lens lit displays that achieves 180 degrees field of view in a compact form factor. Furthermore, we seek to achieve more moderated spatial resolution trade-off by specifically not supporting retinal light field output. So how would this work? Well, in a conventional VR HMD, a large lens is placed in front of the display at a distance slightly less than the focal length. This creates a virtual image, usually one to three meters away. A wide field of view requires a larger lens. Unfortunately, for performance reasons, large lenses require long focal lengths. 
Thus, VR headsets derive much of their bulk from the space between the optics and the display. It turns out that lens arrays may be of some help here. By scaling the lens down and using an array of them, the focal lengths remain small. Each lens maps to its own region on the display, known as an elemental image. In turn, each of these elemental images contain a subset of the original source image, shown as a rainbow on the far left. Note that there is some overlap between these image regions. This is a necessity for creating what's referred to as an eye box, or the area in which the eye can move relative to the display and still see a coherent image. This has implications for optical and geometric prototype design. The design space analysis in our paper discusses the mathematics of this in more detail. Finally, when all the regions in the display are seen through their respective lenses, a comparable image is formed in the eye. Next, I will discuss our approach to using lens arrays and the contributions we made to the field in doing so. In our approach, we combine a curved heterogeneous lens array with a curved display for each eye, offering wide stereo field of view. A cylindrically curved shape simplifies design complexity by reducing the number of unique optical elements. We create a single column of lenses and then replicate this column along a cylinder. In fact, due to column symmetry, only a half column's worth of lenses required custom design. Nevertheless, it turned out that even this presented us with quite a challenge. As for contributions, we claim four areas that we hope our efforts provide the research community with some insight. First, we conducted a design space analysis, specifically for curved lens arrays. Second, we created an optical design with sufficient spot size and pupil swim performance, a non-trivial task. Third, we made the design a reality and demonstrated it with real-time and high-resolution implementations. Finally, we provide some assessment of the system we built. Now I will proceed to discuss each of these contributions in turn. Design Space Analysis Unlike most systems, our design features a curved lens array. In particular, we use a cylindrically shaped array. This imposes a unique set of constraints, particularly on the size of the elemental images used. More importantly, a cylindrical array gives us two advantages. One, it affords a wide field of view, and two, it assists optical performance by allowing the eye to turn and look on axis through the lenses, at least along the dimension of the curve. We performed a full geometric analysis of a cylindrically curved array system using a thick lens model. This revealed a number of interesting trade-offs between the size of the eye box, the pitch of the lenslets, and effective spatial resolution. Thus, we set out to target a design with a 12 mm eye box, enough to fit a human eye, and an eye relief of 22 mm, along with a spatial resolution targeted around 9 pixels per degree, assuming one of the more recent cell phone displays. This analysis serves as a starting point to begin the optical design process. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to discuss the details of the analysis in this presentation. I would encourage anyone interested to read this section of our TVCG paper. Next, I'll discuss optical design with respect to inherent issues, our approach, and some notes about fabrication. In designing a lens array with good performance, it was immediately apparent that we had to contend with two major issues. First, off-axis performance. It turns out that a homogeneous array of lenslets can have atrocious performance when used for a large field of view. Most optical components are designed to be seen on axis. In this range, they can be quite sharp. For a large FOV, however, the eye must necessarily look through peripheral lenses at an angle far from their central axis. The image on the lower left is a full simulation of a homogeneous array. The peripheral image is quickly dominated by blur caused by field curvature and chromatic aberrations, among others. This is why it is absolutely essential to use a heterogeneous design with each lens tuned separately. Another issue is pupil swim. Pupil swim can be described as an image distortion that changes as the eye looks around the scene. This can be observed in nearly all HMDs today and is already a source of simulator sickness. Furthermore, since the distortion pattern changes dynamically as the eye moves, it cannot be completely corrected by preconditioning the image. The video on the right depicts a single lenslet with substantial pupil swim distortion despite its sharp performance. Unfortunately for us, it turns out that pupil swim in lens arrays is yet an even bigger problem. Imagine the distortion shown on the video happening in 50 lenses at the same time. That would cause breaks at every lens boundary and ruin any sense of image fusion. Optical design proved to be an interesting challenge. Initially, we tried to use a widely popular commercial lens design package. However, our efforts were plagued by a combination of slow ray tracing performance and ray tracing errors, causing extremely slow design iterations. 
This made it nearly impossible to converge on designs that minimized both off-axis aberration and pupil swim, to say nothing of other geometric constraints. After much effort, the conclusion was clear. We needed to implement our own lens design software specifically suited to heterogeneous arrays. It turns out that ray tracing techniques from the high-performance graphics community fit the bill. After some initial testing, we used Intel Embry to build real-time, interactive tools for lenslet design. In addition, we implemented a simple optimization algorithm and supplied it with a cost function that penalized image blur as well as pupil swim. For details, check out the paper. All told, we were finally able to converge and quickly on good solutions using an Intel Core i7 CPU. As for the lenslets themselves, each is modeled front and back as freeform surfaces. We chose a Chebyshev polynomial representation as this provided orthogonal terms, which is useful for optimization, and an intuitive mapping to optical aberrations such as coma, astigmatism, etc. Again, have a look at the paper for more detail. No discussion of optics would be complete without a mention of fabrication. Ideally, we would have wanted to injection mold our lenses, but this is an enormously cost and time prohibitive process for a research lab where prototypes are constantly evolving. So we settled on a five axis computer numerical controlled milling directly in acrylic with polishing in post. Some machine shops are able to turn such designs out quite quickly and with remarkable fidelity. However, the CNC tool radius limits the accuracy one can obtain in the crevices between convex lenses. We built two kinds of prototypes. First, we show a dynamic prototype with real-time rendering. To get a curved OLED display, we destroyed many Samsung Galaxy S9 phones. Fortunately, some phone repair shops are better equipped to do this using low temperature. This finally gave us access to a flexible OLED. Then we used the Google Daydream API to enable low persistence display mode and wrote an OpenGL application to display a full screen lookup table. The lookup table, derived from our own ray tracing data, maps each pixel on the display to its respective position on the target virtual image, in this case a panorama. This allows us to compensate for geometric lens distortion. But alas, not all issues could be solved. These OLEDs were never intended to be driven outside the cell phone. Thus, we had to attach the phone batteries and electronics to each eyepiece, making the prototype needlessly bulky. Furthermore, the displays have limited resolution. Our second prototype shows where we could go with much higher display resolution were it available. We jettisoned the electronics and instead used color photo film with over 2,000 pixels per inch resolution. The film is exposed in continuous tone using LVT technology. This provides us with a high-resolution curved image. We also needed a backlight, so we built a custom curved light guide. Overall, this provides us with a fantastic means of assessing image quality and device compactness. Let's take a closer look. This video shows what the user actually sees as the eye moves into the eye box. We shot this using a wide-angle camera with an aperture set similar to the human eye. You can see that as we enter the eye box, the image fuses quite nicely. For system assessment, I'll briefly discuss eye box analysis, demonstrate image fusion, and talk a little bit about the volume of the overall prototype. For more details, please see the paper. To demonstrate that we actually succeeded in making a usable prototype, we again trained our camera on the eyepiece and physically moved it through the eye box. You can see that the pupil swim is well controlled with image fusion holding up to substantial eye movement. For the sake of science, we voided the warranty on the Pimax 5K and tore out its optical assembly. This allows us to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of optical bulkiness to our own design. In the image on the left, the Pimax optical assembly is shown on the top and ours is shown on the bottom. This represents roughly a 50% reduction in volume and a device that hugs the face rather than sticks out at the sides. We also performed an extensive eye box analysis using ray tracing data from our array design. The process for doing so is elaborated thoroughly in the submission video. To summarize briefly, we show an approximately 12 mm by 19 mm eye box. So what are the limitations of our work and how might we address them? Well, first, we couldn't find a flexible OLED with a driver board. This caused our real-time prototype to be bulkier than necessary. Second, our eye box is smaller than traditional HMDs. This is remedied by our use of a mechanical IPD adjustment. Third, with a short eye relief and a curved shape, the design doesn't fit eyeglasses very well. It is possible that we could implement curved Alvarez lens inserts. 
Alvarez lenses are lenses whose elements can slide along each other and change the focal length. Perhaps more important to note is that the resolution in our design is substantially lower than traditional designs, by about 65%. Eye tracking could improve this if we were to redesign the optics, pair it with an eye tracking system, shrink the eye box down, and trade back in favor of resolution. Finally, a cylindrical design was chosen for the simplicity of the design, not for the industrial design. A fully ergonomic design requires custom designing many lenslets, but we think that would be a worthwhile task. To summarize, we believe this is the first work to demonstrate and analyze the promise of using curved, heterogeneous micro lens arrays for virtual reality. We've achieved a 180 degree field of view, a compact form factor, optical performance that is acceptable both in terms of off-axis imaging and pupil swim, and we provide a design space analysis. We hope this work stimulates new approaches and accelerates the day when VR becomes ubiquitous. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for the interesting work. I think it's a nice system work. Uh, Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the interesting work. I think it's a nice system work. Uh, Hi. Uh, so, no interesting work. I think it's a nice system work. Uh, Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for the. Okay, uh, here are several questions uh, from Slido. Um, first is from uh, Killer Johnson, so thanks for the talk, uh, groundbreaking. What's your guess on a uh, timeline on seeing this come to fruition? Well, and I mean, uh, you, the company I work for, Intel, of course, doesn't permit me to, to speculate on productization or anything of that sort. So this is you know, strictly a research prototype at this point. Um, there are still a number of, of things I think that we would need to overcome. I think we would need to demonstrate a prototype with higher resolution, that would be nice. Um, I would like to see something that's more ergonomic and closer to what would look like in a final industrial design, but I wouldn't want to comment at this point. Uh, okay, another question is from uh, Kiyoshi Kiyokawa. Uh, in re reality, how much can you rotate your eyes to the right and to the left without a significant loss in image quality? Right, so recall from earlier in the presentation that the design is currently a cylinder. So if you rotate your eyes to the left and the right, pretty much no matter which way you rotate, you're looking on axis through the lenses. So whatever's in your central vision is essentially the same sharpness everywhere. But the, the question asker may have had a, a different idea in mind. Um, maybe he's talking about peripheral vision or something. Maybe he could clarify. Okay. Uh, then Next question, I think the last one. How will you prove on the distortion to the image happening when moving the pupil between each lens lit as shown in the footage when moving the camera around? So a couple of things about that. So the pupil swim, a large amount of it has been reduced through our optimization process in the lens surfaces. But we also have issues, remember from the fabrication slide where I talked about issues we were having with the lens lip boundaries. So when we do a CNC machining process, we actually have uh, these valleys between the lenses that are smoothed out that are incorrect because of the radiusing of the tool. That creates a, a swim issue actually on the boundaries of lenses, lenslets as it is. And you can see some of this in the footage. Uh, furthermore, there are reductions we should make in stray light um, uh, through lens interstices and boundaries. Um, so I think, I think uh, there are a couple of things left that we can do 
to improve it to improve that. But it is substantially improved of where the prototype started when we began. Mm, okay. Thank you, Joseph, for the wonderful work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now we go to the next one. Okay, the next uh, paper is illuminated focus, vision augmentation using spatial defocusing while focused with eyeglasses with a high speed projector. Hello. Uh, the author is Tatsu Tsuki Uta, uh, Tatsuki Iwa, Takifumi Hiraki, and uh, Kosuki Sato from Osaka University. The paper will be presented by Tatsu Yuki Uta. Okay, let's welcome. Hello, I'm Tatsuji Ueda from Osaka University. My talk today is going to be on illuminated focus, spatially defocusing air glasses for real scene. The focus blur, also known as bokeh, is one of the natural visual effects. It has been widely used in photographs and movies to control the visual saliency of a specific area. Defocusing is important optical effects for our human vision to understand the three-dimensional structure of a real scene. People can visually perceive fine details of an object in their depth of field. In addition to these examples, the blur effect realizes a wide range of fundamental human-computer interaction techniques, such as user interface in mobile phone, visual guidance to draw users' attention to real-world objects, concealing undesired visual information for privacy protection, and focus and context visualization. These interaction techniques are essential in augmented reality AR applications. To deploy them in AR system, spatial focus control of a real world appearance is necessary. Video see through AR system can relatively easily blur a real scene by digital image processing. But optical see-through AR system is not supported due to optical limitations. Then, we propose illuminated focus that optically controls perceived bra independent of depth in OSD AR. In order to add blurring function with OSD AR, we employ Electrically tunable lens, ETL, as a focus tunable optics system. And we use a high speed projector as time multiplexing illumination to determine the broad region of a real scene. Illuminated focus makes partially defocusing a real scene beyond the physical constraints by synchronizing these devices. ETL is a lens that can modulate the optical power by an electric signal. Now, we describe illuminated focus technique with a simple example. For example, suppose there are three objects, front, middle, back objects, in front of you. When ETL periodically modulates the focus, only the focused object appears clear and the other objects are blurred. This is called focal sweep. Next, we introduce a high-speed projector. 
the front and middle objects are illuminated at the same time when the front object is in focus. On the other hand, the back object is illuminated when the back object is in focus. We synchronize ETL focal sweep and projectile illumination timing. Then the front and back object appear clear. And the middle object, ball, looks blurred because the focus is off the ball. The optical power of the ETL is periodically modulated at greater than 60 Hz. Then, because a human can't perceive illumination changes at high temporal frequencies, only the ball uh, appeared blurred, averaging the view of the object. This is system diagram. The digital to analog converter outputs sinusoidal signal to ETLs and trigger signal to projector to synchronize illumination. We control to project uh, different projection images at different voltages. The ETL's driving frequency is 60 Hz. The projection timing is determined taking into account the response speed of the ETL. Now, we describe some evaluation of illuminated focus technique. Please check the paper for further evaluations, such as the degree of blurring. We investigated whether or not the depth-independent spatial defocusing is possible in the proposed system. We placed four objects, but bus, case, and dinosaur at different rotations. We prepared two conditions of the spatial defocusing. In the first condition, we made only the bus on a 500 mm appear blurred, and the other object appear focused. As a result, left movie shows Focus modulation and illumination are synchronized accuracy. So we can capture the scene only by blood at right figure. In the second condition, we made only the bus appear focused and the other object appear blurred. As a result, movie shows Focus modulation and illumination are synchronized accuracy too. So we can capture the scene only the bus focused as right figure. In addition to the previous two conditions, we verified many other conditions to make sure the system was working correctly. It is optically impossible to produce the appearances naturally. This result verifies the effectiveness of our spatial defocusing technique. Next, we examined methods to reduce the seams, which is unique problem of the system. In this video, you can see two types of seams gap and overlap between focused and defocused region. When we see a real-world object through typical eyeglasses that correct for either a myopia or hyperopia, the apparent size of the object becomes smaller or larger. The same phenomenon occurs in the proposed system. Two things, gap and overlap, are caused by apparent scaling of observed real objects. 
In order to alleviate this problem, we propose the op operation of the uh, projectile illumination. Based on the difference in magni magnification uh, calculated from the eye model, the same region is determined so that the region continues naturally. The intensity of the illumination in the same region is decreased linearly from the unscaled area to the scaled area. From the captured result, we confirm that the proposed method could successfully alleviate the visible seam. Now, we describe some applications of illuminated focus. We made the eyeglasses inserted two ETLs. Eyeglass frame is fabricated from FDM 3D printer. First, visual guidance application. In this example, in the museum, a curator can move the focused area according to the explanation to direct visitors' gaze to the specific area. In the second example, the system can guide a player by making a part of a musical score to be played appear focused. Second, focus and context visualization application. The focus and context visualization system allows users to focus on a relevant subset of the data, but retaining context of surrounding element. In this example, the system supports a student studying at desk to concentrate on reading textbook. Other areas on the desk, including comic book, appear blurred. Third, considering information application, diminished reality. For example, it can be used to hide unpleasant objects, such as insects. In another example, this system considers undesirable sign of skin aging of a face, like brooches, pores, and wrinkles, by blurring them out. The last, enhance the depth of perception application. This is a new vision augmentation system for 2D picture by making the background region appear blurred. We can perceive that the depth variation of the picture is enhanced by focusing and defocusing effects. For future work, we are developing a spatially, defo spatially zoomable OSD AR. By zooming in on a part of the real scene, you can emphasize that part. In this video, we zoom in on parts of the document to make it easier to see the details. This method uses multiple ETLs synchronized with high-speed illumination. Here is summary of this presentation. We propose illuminated focus, augmented reality glasses, enabling depth-independent, spatially defocusing of a human vision. Our techniques spatially manipulate the depth of field using tunable lens and high-speed projector. We realized various vision augmentation applications based on our method to show its potential to expand the application field of optical see-through air. Thank you.
Oh, very interesting work. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I think that you have shown uh, many interesting uh, applications, uh, inspiring work. And that there are some questions from the slide. So we, uh, first is the, is the system affected by environmental light? Does it work uh, in, in a not dark room? So you need a dark room for, for it to work. Oh, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, this system is effective at work in dark room environment. So uh, the, the effect of ambient illumination uh, have, cannot be ignored. But uh, mm -hmm. we found a small amount of ambient lightning was acceptable. And the, an another solution in a, a controlled indoor environment in which uh, multiple projectors cooperate to illuminate uh, system is working correctly, not only in a dark room. OK, thank you. The next question. Uh, for for the future work, have you considered replacing the projector to near eye occlusion capable SLMs so that uh, we can use the system under normal lighting conditions? Mm. Oh, that is interesting a uh, point. Uh, I haven't uh, thought of that point. Uh, so I, I will look into that yes okay uh, i have one more questions so yes. how how about the dynamic scene if it's a dynamic scene will you track the object and uh, change the focus focal uh, focus yes uh, the system is usable in dynamic environment uh, for, by using uh, 3d trackers Okay. System, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Yeah, thank you. So now we go to the next one. So the next paper is toward a standard that has the classification of foveated displays. The authors are Josephus Butte, Ben Bodd, uh, John Kim, Trey Greg, Tag Chiu, Abed, Michelle Stengel, uh, Khan Alkist, and David Lubick from Amidu. So the presentation will be given by Joseph Spute from uh, Amidu. So uh, let's welcome. Thanks, Zubo, for the introduction. Um, like you said, I'm Joseph Spute, uh, and I'm a research scientist in the New Experiences Research Group at NVIDIA. And today I'd like to talk to you about how we've come to think about foveated displays in our research group uh, and one way that they might be classified. 
And this is a little bit of a different sort of uh, paper than, than many of the, these other ones in the session that are talking about innovations in the technology. Here we're talking more about how to classify um, some of these innovations we've been seeing, um, including some of the work we've done in, in other publications. I've listed my co-authors on, on this article in the slide here, but I should also recognize that this work um, was influenced by conversations with others, both at NVIDIA and uh, elsewhere, um, and, and their contributions are very much appreciated. So the first thing we need to know before we can begin to classify foveated displays is what a foveated display is. Uh, in preparing this talk, I did a quick Google search and grabbed a couple quotes uh, I found from others. The first quote uh, I've listed here indicates that a foveated display should be one that moves to where the user is looking. Uh, the second quote says that a foveated display should have different pixel density at different parts of the display. What we've tried to do with our paper is create a classification system for foveated displays that accepts both of these definitions. Um, as an aside, in my research group at NVIDIA, I've found that depending on who you ask, either of these definitions might be the most natural, uh, and sometimes even more interpretations exist. Uh, I've come to understand that the definition of a foveated display is largely in the eye of the beholder uh, and depends where they're coming from. Quite literally, the term foveated comes from two roots. Uh, one is the fovea, which is the pitted region of the eye that happens to have the highest visual acuity. Uh, the second is the verb foveate, which is the action a person takes when they angle their eye at something, which places the light from that object in the fovea. Obviously, these are related, but slightly different uh, functions. In this talk, I'm mostly going to talk about head-mounted displays, but we tried to present a, an approach for classification that's still fairly relevant for other kinds of displays, um, both on desktops and laptops and, and other sorts of things that might exist, uh, light fields, uh, what have you. To give you an example of the kind of foveation I'm talking about, uh, this is a photo I took at the zoo that I edited with, with photo editing software to demonstrate foveation when the expected gaze location is on the parrot. The idea is that the periphery can be lower resolution, shown here with a simple blur, while the foveal region of the display needs to be higher resolution to line up with the human visual system. To add reasons why we might want to use foveated displays in imaging, it's worth talking about the anticipated benefits of wider deployment of this technology. First, when done correctly and integrated across the computing system, foveation allows a reduction in raw pixel count, which reduces rendering and compute power required to achieve the visual experience. This reduction in compute requirements also provides similar benefits in terms of increased battery life and reduced power output. These improvements also cascade to improve the form factor of devices by reducing the size needed for spreading out heat and also increase the potential operating lifetime of the device. Now that we understand what foveated displays are and some of the benefits that might come from them, uh, it's worth talking about the objectives of this uh, classification system that we're proposing. First, what we want to do is create meaningful divisions of the possible design space of foveated displays. Uh, second, we also wanted something that would be easy for a user to classify in a busy exhibition hall when only given a few minutes to evaluate the display. Um, I want to make it clear that the proposal I'm describing here is not meant to be an absolute truth or a universal classification that will solve all of the problems in classifying these dis designs. Instead, I intend for this proposal to elicit discussion from the relevant companies and researchers and hope that over the coming years, we might arrive at a consensus. With that in mind, uh, the human visual system has a visual acuity that's driven by the number of road, rods and cones, as well as ganglion cells and other parts, including the brain. When you look into this, you'll find figures that show that the visual acuity is highest at the center of vision and falls off toward the periphery. While it's extremely valuable to continue to strive to understand the human visual system at deeper and deeper levels, for the sake of this discussion, we're going to establish an approximation of the human visual acuity distribution function, or ADF, which is a monotonically decreasing function from the center of human vision. Furthermore, we'll compare that ADF, the dashed purple line in the figure on the left here, with the resolution distribution function, or RDF, of the display hardware and optics, which is the solid blue line in the figure on the left. Convenient to this discussion, 
we can think of a central region that maintains approximately the same high resolution as the fovea of the display or the foveal inset. Um, and the part outside the high resolution can be considered the periphery. To help you understand this chart on the left, the x-axis is the visual eccentricity, which means that the center of gaze is at zero on the x-axis. And the resolution is displayed in cycles per degree, uh, which falls off as it moves toward the periphery. Nominal human visual acuity is indicated by 2020 in the Snellen chart. Um, and it's usually thought of it as achieving 30 cycles per degree at the center of vision, as you can see in the drawing. This RDF is only defined for an instantaneous gaze direction, since any change in gaze has the potential to move the origin. Thus, the concept of gaze contingence becomes essential as well, which is the degree to which the display is capable of responding with a consistent RDF as the gaze shifts or the user foveates. Gaze contingence can be accomplished in a number of ways, and our focus in this classification is not necessarily on the implementation uh, but rather the result of the underlying implementation. In fact, both RDF and gaze contingents will describe as the experience seen by the user. So this classification is going to have uh, one part, the resolution distribution function, and then the other part is the gaze contingents, which I'll go into now. In the RDF axis, the classifications we came up with should be relatively straightforward to identify as a user with a given visual acuity. The highest classification is type A, which indicates that the display's RDF meets or exceeds the human, human's ADF for the entire field of view. Types B and C meet or exceed the ADF for the entire fovea or periphery respectively, either of which may be preferred depending on the application. Finally, the RDF for type D falls below the ADF in both the fovea and the periphery. And the figures on the right We've given examples of two-tiered displays that would land in each classification. Green regions indicate eccentricities for which the ADF was met, while red regions indicate the RDF was not sufficient to meet the ADF. While some green area may be needed to blend between different display resolutions, it's worth noting that the significant green area uh, represents waste or inefficiency, since the human may not see the additional pixels in that part of their field of view. Since a user's visual acuity or Snellen ratio is directly related to their ability to perceive the display's RDF, it should be reported along with the classification. Thus a 2040 user might consider a display type A, while a 2020 user could arrive at a type C designation if the display doesn't quite reach 2020 in the fovea. Since relatively few HMDs on the market today actually support 2020 visual acuity, except sometimes in the periphery, uh, many existing HMD designs are actually type C or D. A few notes on the ADF we're using here. Instead of just using rod and cone density or the ganglion cell density, we opted to base our ADF on approximations of perceptual, uh, or, excuse me. We opted to base our ADF approximation on perceptual data, uh, which we got from Wertheim and Anstis. Furthermore, we ignore the blind spot, assume radial symmetry, and propose a couple possible functions in the paper. There, there are more details in the paper, but improving the approximate ADF is an area that could use more data and future work. The second axis of classification is gaze contingents, which we define as the range of eye motion over which the display is able to maintain a consistent RDF. We give the highest designation, class one, to displays which support the full range of motion possible by the human eye, and establish class two as what we consider to be a reasonably good range of eye motion to support the majority of human uses. While the human eye does not exceed plus or minus, sorry, while the human eye does exceed plus or minus 15 degrees at, time, at times, a large number of practical uses can be covered by a display motion in that range. Our class, Three, designation we believe to be useful for displays intended for niche applications, where a narrow range of motion is all that is needed. And finally, class four displays capture the rest of uh, the displays that could exist, and are displays which may be intended to be looked at in a single general gaze direction. A, singer, a single informational display with a very narrow field of view would be an example of this kind of display being a good design. 
Now that we've defined our terms, we can lay these two axes out in a grid, which will allow us to place any foveated display in that space. Letters indicating how well the RDF matches the ADF and numbers indicating how well the display responds to changing gaze. Here I've dropped a red X to show the ideal foveated display for every use. Note that I've labeled this 2020 to indicate that this assumes nominal human visual acuity. Uh, but if the user classifying the display has a different visual acuity, they should uh, put that in, in their classification. I'll use this chart to show the classifications of a few co commercial and research prototypes in the next few slides. With a large number of displays on the market and certain to be released over the coming years, uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of every display out there. So first, we've classified most of these first generation HMDs um, from VR as class D4 because they lack any sort of gaze contingence without being paired with a foveated rendering algorithm. And they do not match uh, 2020 visual acuity except perhaps in the extreme periphery. For some of the recent second generation VR HMDs, we've given them class C4 because they once again do not have any gaze contingence. However, due to the increased resolution, we consider them to generally match the periphery for at least the central gaze angle. Vario has released the first commercially foveated display, which embeds a small high resolution inset alongside fairly standard wide field of view periphery. At least publicly, they have not yet shown movement to respond to user gaze. Thus, we give them the classification A4. Uh, in the chart on the right here, I put a light orange X and C3 as well, because if you accept some peripheral artifacts, then the gaze can move within a narrow range inside the foveal inset display. And I believe this is the intended usage pattern of Vario's product. Finally, some research from our uh, research group was presented at SIGGRAPH 2019, and it demonstrates the first publicly shown gaze contingent hardware. Uh, this solution we consider class B2 because it is gaze contingent, but only over around 15 degrees of eye motion. And the periphery will occasionally have noticeable artifacts. Uh, I'd refer you to that paper if you'd like more details about that design. There's a bunch of other discussion in the paper about a variety of related topics, but given time constraints, I won't get in, go into all of this in the talk. Please take a look at the paper if you want to read more. It's worth noting that future fovea display taxonomies may be strengthened by directly including some of these issues in the way they classify displays. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions that you might have. Uh, if you're not watching this talk at the conference, Twitter is a great way to reach me. If you are at the conference, then I'll um, take questions now or uh, go in, into a hubs room after the session uh, during the break for anyone who would li like to speak. Thank you. Right, thank you for, <clears throat> for your talk. Joseph, yep. so um, I think this uh, valuable classification of the forward display, and uh, there are some questions. I think, yeah, I, I have one questions. Um, so you, uh, I noticed that your all, all your model and the classification is based on normal uh, illumination. Uh, for, so if it's for low illumination and low contrast uh, scene, how will your classification work? Yeah, we, we have some discussion of uh, different brightness levels and uh, the, the way human vision, visual acuity changes at different brightness in the paper. Um, certainly things would change because, you know, we, we were kind of assuming nominal hu human vision at regular brightness levels. Um, your low light vision is certainly very different and you end up with, with different uh, vision. It's our understanding that most of these displays are designed to operate uh, kind of at the appropriate brightness levels. So in, in general, we think this classification is still useful. Okay, thank you. There seems no more questions on the slide. Thank okay. you for your talk. Great, Yourself. thank you. Okay.
Okay, the next paper uh, is computational phase modulated eyeglasses. Uh, the author are, are Yuta Ito, uh, Tobias Langlotz, Stephanie Zorman, Daisuke Iwai, Kyokowa Kiyoshi, Toshiyuki Amakno from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, University of Otaka, uh, NAST, and the University of Wakayama. So the paper will be presented by Yota uh, Ito. So let's welcome. We present computational phase modulated eyeglasses. The speaker is Yuta Ito, and this is joint work with Tobias Langlotz, Stephanie Zoman, Daisuke Iwai, Kiyoshi Kiyokawa, and Toshiki Amano. So our system briefly described in this figure, we present a smart eyeglasses, which can be reconfigurable and dynamically programmable. So before we go into the detail of our system, we briefly look through the related works. So the related area of this work is human augmentation, where people aim to enhance or assist human capabilities. And especially we are focusing on our human visual capability like eyesight. So we are we, we're gonna briefly discuss about this current situation in this kind of field. So there is actually interesting fact that social impact of eye reflection anomalies. Like me, nearsighted people or farsighted people, if you typically get elderly, and then there is a certain economical cost for myopia, for example. And it's quite huge, like 45 billion per year in worldwide. And the fact tells that the percentage of like myopia is of course increasing. And this is kind of drastic statistics because it was used to be 25% like 70s and then already in 2000, they, they already got like 41% in US. In 15th century, there are already this kind of like art that describing already a priest probably is wearing an canonical or a traditional eyeglasses. And nowadays, like 2018, there is already a commercial product which allows you to electrically change the like near sight and the far side glasses. So this is not like a progressive eyeglasses, but more like it's switchable eyeglass. And if you look at some research area, there are people already implemented kind of static smart eyeglasses with fixed optical components, like this vision multiplexing paper, they combine, basically combine those zoom lenses so that a person suffers some problem at the center of the field of view, for example, can also utilize the peripheral vision by using those zoom lenses. This is kind of interesting work, right? And recent years, we also got the dynamic smart eyeglasses. For example, this work presented at the SIGGRAPH, I think, demonstrated at SIGGRAPH, and then also they had paper now, a very bifocal lens system, which can dynamically control the diopter of the eyeglasses, because these are consisting of liquid crystal tuna electrical tunable lenses, so you can dynamically actually change the focal length. There are, I, I, we see potentials of smart eyeglasses. If we have such kind of like programmable, flexible eyeglasses, perhaps it improves our quality of life because you don't want to always switch different eyeglasses depending on what you want to do, like reading books or just going outside. And maybe combined with other smart systems like Sisu, uh, like head mounted displays, maybe you can also use it for like zooming effects, smart zooming eyeglasses, more like a science fiction. Or more practical use cases, more realistic use case would be like visual assistance for tasks that need a precision works, tasks like surgery or soldering that you really have to zoom part of the scene and so on. So these backgrounds brings us to the concept. So we want to present a programmable lens combined with a first person camera. So this way we can, we can dynamically tune, tune the parameter of the eyeglasses and based on, this, based on the scene that the user is looking at. So actually there is many programmable optics 
But we, let's say we want to have several basic functionalities like focus correction, or you have some multi-focus functionalities, or pan and tilt, or more sophisticated ways like aberration correction, and like zooming or macro pictures. On all these things, actually you can implement with like a liquid crystal lens, you can do this for focus correction, or you can utilize it for zooming. And the multi-focus, there is already some intraocular diffraction lenses, which basically uh, once you lose your crystalline lens inside your eyeball, so doctors, they replace the lenses with these kind of uh, special lenses to, to regain their focusing functionality, at least like a near sight and a far sight. And the pan tilt is a pretty much common, like using galvanic scanning mirrors and aberration correction, you also have that adaptive office. But our system we present, it's, it's kind of cover all these functionalities and you can switch different functionalities by just choosing what kind of lens parameters you want to show. So to go on the detail of our system, we have to first introduce the key uh, optical devices, which is called phase-only spatial light modulator, or PSLM. So this is mere a liquid crystal mirror display. So it's tiny, like a display panel, but it works as not like ordinary display to show image, but it works as a controlling the refraction index of each pixel. So if you apply different voltage, then each pixel then change the state of the reflection. So the light coming into this display panel gets some phase delay, or it basically reflected by the display panel. This kind of device is actually used to be used in computer generated holograms. So basically they are using laser beam, right? So as you can see those figures. And then in the second column, you have those input phase images, which is just like a grayscale image displayed on the display. But of course this grayscale image will be mapped into the reflection values of each pixel. And by designing these kind of phase images, you can manipulate the laser incoming laser beam by using diffraction effect. That means it's just a display. So you just plug it into with like HDMI cable and then you can display whatever images you want, which means that you can actually reconfigure the display panel or lens in the way that you want to display something. For example, if you render this kind of concentric lens gradation pattern, which is repeating like centric lens circles, and then it works as actually a Fresnel lens. So the incoming light then will be formed focusing at some point. So this works as like a convex lens. And this is actual video we took, we took a shot uh, on, the, on the display panel with white background. And then as you can see, the display panel looks as if it's a, like a thin glass plate which changes the shape, right? Maybe I could just replay the video again. So in this way, we can actually control the lens parameter of the display in the very simplest case. And so this is a, our proof of concept system with, a, it's actually kind of bulky one because it's a monocular, it's a benchtop system and it's also only monocular. So basically this is kind of polarization optics which realizes with beam splitter a see-through view of the user. So the light coming from the scene going through the display panel reflected by the PSLM and then you get the resulting image, which is already passing through this program of lens. So there are some examples like varifocal lens. So this lens, you can of course then tune the focus point of the image. So in this video, a user perspective camera at the fixed focal length, it's just see through the see the scene through the system, our system, and we display different lens parameters. And then this way you can focus, excuse me, you can focus the different depth point. Like between this case, like it's from 10 centimeters to uh, like about uh, roughly about uh, one meter. 
And interestingly, you can also combine different lenses, right? And this is like multifocal lenses where you render two different lenses simultaneously. Multifocal glasses for it has the potential to intervene the progression of nearsightedness for children. So maybe if you have our system as a, like just eyeglasses form factor, maybe we can dynamically display lenses for over years. And maybe this can be useful for such kind of applications. But anyway, in this picture, as you can see, two objects, like one is closer, uh, three objects, one is closer and the two are just far away. They are both now focused at the same position on the right figure because we are rendering two lenses simultaneously. And you can also combine different lenses because you just need to combine some two lens images. Then you can get a new lens which has two, which keep this, the functionalities. So in this case, we just rendered like a plate phase image and the spherical phase images combined. You can then realize shifting and also refocusing. And if you combine multiple PSLMs, then you can even manipulate the, zoom, the field of view. So you can zoom or, or, make, or like zoom out images like this picture. Due to, some, due to our optics limitations, so the, the image is quite dark, but at least we could show that the system works as a, like a zooming lens. And after we verified those basic functionalities, we also combined the scene camera so that we can implement kind of dynamic feedback of the scene camera and the dynamic lens. And this application, for example, is a very, very kind of a fake setup where we just keep track the position of the marker in the scene by the scene camera and our lens just try to always focus at the same at the same marker while it's changing the lens. So here's the image, here's the video. So user perspective camera is again fixed at the static focal position, but because of the program of lens and the scene camera, so the, cam the user perspective camera always can see the markup sharp because the, 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 our lens system just dynamically reconfiguring it. And the second implementation, we implemented the dual 4C application we, saw, we showed you. And then this case, again, we dynamically calculate the position of the two markers using from the scene camera image. And then we dynamically reconfigure the lens parameter so that the, the user's view can focus two depths simultaneously. Yeah, it's a bit laggy, but it's, it's working. And one of the, and then the next example, we also consider, huh, is it possible to stabilize our view by using the plate phase image, which is just like image shift. And like a camera, expensive camera, where they have like handshaking and then the anti-handshaking thing, stabilization thing. And then we also implemented that. So in the left figure, it's just a C3 image without anything. And then the marker is just shifting along the X direction. And then once we stabilize it, we display this view shift image and then always dynamically changing the parameter. Okay, let me play again. So it's kind of unstable, but still it's, some, it's somehow stabilizing it. And then we find it's a it's very interesting application because it's again like a dynamic feedback of the scene camera and the programmable lens. Of course, the system has many limitations. First of all, the optical quality suffers from all those physical effects, like chromatic aberration means like each different spectrum. So like color, RGB, for example, they get some different refraction uh, effect and then you get some blurry color, color breaking issue. And also the system is like a bench top, so it's quite bulky. A summary, we present a computational phase modulated eyeglasses. So this is a, like a smart eyeglass system which aims to optimize our human vision by dynamically changing the lens parameters. So the advantage of the system is that we can dynamically change different functionalities of the 
lenses like focus collection or like mood point focusing and also zoom effect. And by combining first person camera, it has also potential to dynamically feedback the scene and uh, it just adapt the human vision based on what they are seeing. And the current limitations are the, the form factor of the system. And also there are several optical issues. And we also need to implement stereo system. And we also need to consider the practical applications. But we believe this concept showed enough potential so that people can explore this kind of smart eyeglasses. Thank you for listening. Ah, uh, thank you, Yuta, for this uh, interesting work. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, I, I have one question. So I noticed that in your uh, result when you mentioned about the stabilization, uh, it seems right. the the stabilization result has some um, uh, artifact. Uh, can you explain the reason and how to make it? Do you have any better solution for this part? Yeah, okay, that's a very interesting question. So as I explained, so that's typically the chromatic aberration because we display kind of like this plate face, which tries to shift the image to one direction, right? And this amount of shifting is totally dependent on the wavelengths. So the different wavelengths has slightly different view shift. And this is kind of essential problem we couldn't avoid in a single SLM design. But maybe if we combine several SLMs, like you can count, you can just drive two different phase modulators, then it would it might be possible to just like reduce this effect by just countering this kind of chromatic operation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I noticed there's a question from Slido, and um, so this is uh, from. Are Arfing from Mississippi State. Um, so thanks for your wonderful presentation. He has two questions. What is the farthest object distance you considered in your implementation? What is the maximum focal difference you considered? Okay. Um, yeah, that's also quite a good question. Um, Theoretically, it should be possible to cover the infinite distance because you just need to converge the parallel beam from the infinite distance point from the infinite distance to on the retina. It's I think it's more rather question would be how close you can tune the focal lengths because PSLM is a thin liquid crystal lens and it has a limited uh, refraction index, which means even if you want to render sh render a really sharp concave or a convex lens, you can't do that because of the, the reflection limit. I hope this is answering oh. your question. Okay, thank you. And um, okay, it seems no more question on Slido. And uh, okay, I think that's, thank you very much for, for your interesting work, Yuta. Thank so, you. Uh, I think today we have a wonderful session. We have five very interesting work and some uh, very inspiring ideas. And thank you all for the audience to attend this session. And if you are interested to uh, discuss with the authors in this session, you can go to Slack to send a message to the authors. And uh, I think you uh, they can answer you some questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, so enjoy the conference. <laughs>